Good afternoon, Tamra Davis. Welcome on VH Berries. Thank you. Nice to have, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I am extremely grateful. How are you doing today? I'm very good. I'm good. It's the end of my day here in California. Absolutely, Tamra Davis, and I would love uh, to start uh, by talking about documentaries because a documentary is equivalent to a mirror held to, held up to nature and reflecting the raw, unfiltered tapestry of existence. And in that light, it is essential to recognize the unmistakable Davis flair because you are intertwining unfiltered authenticity with the art of storytelling. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you. That's a beautiful way to describe documentary filmmaking. And I would love, uh, Tamra Davis, uh, to start with one of your titles called It's a John Baldessari Word. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. Um, I was hired to do it through um, the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Los Angeles. And it was when John Baldessari was still alive, which was awesome. So I got to interview him and they were doing a special presentation and they were going to show it. They showed it at the museum. So I kind of wanted to do just like a nice film about him and talk to people that knew him and kind of film it in a style that kind of felt kind of John Baldessari and just kind of do like a, a film that gave people an understanding of who he, who he was and his importance in the world, in the art world. Absolutely. Tamara Davis, through this piece of art, you showed the importance of that uh, artist. And I picked uh, one of my favorite uh, sentence of uh, <laughs> it's a John uh, Baldessari words, uh, which is what's green and goes up and down a pea in an elevator. I know. Yeah, that's one of John Baldessari's, his work. And I, I love that he had humor in his artwork. <laughs> no. So I think it's really fun to show that there sometimes art can be funny. And he, he was such a funny guy. So I really I liked featuring that aspect of him. You loved uh, featuring that aspect uh, in this uh, documentary and that format is a format that you are enjoying a lot. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what uh, led you to direct documentaries? I mean, I feel like from the beginning when I was doing, um, just trying to establish myself as a filmmaker, documentaries are ways to tell short films and kind of, um, I don't know, I think one of my very first films was a film called uh, Vida Loca and don't, not to get confused with Alison Anders movie, but yeah, I made a documentary called Vida Loca and it was about gangs in California and Southern California. And so I felt like it was easy. It was a kind of a format where you could film somebody, interview them, film kind of B roll and put it together into, into a movie. And, um, yeah, I felt like it was a, I really liked that format and I, I continued and I've made a couple of documentaries since then. But yeah, no, I think it's a really cool format and I love documentaries. And it's especially easy if you're trying to become like a, a new filmmaker. It's a little bit easier to finance or put something like that together. It is a little bit easier, as you just mentioned, uh, Tamara Davis, to finance it. And on one side, there is uh, this part uh, of documentary that is, as I mentioned, 
unfiltered uh, and very natural. But on the other hand, uh, it can also give you a lot of space for creativity. For example, in your documentary called Jean-Michel Basquiat, The Radiant Child, when you're starting uh, this piece of art with the sound of a wall muralled old projector. This is a very special sound element. Thank you. Yeah, no, I I know, I don't know, even know. I think that came from, yeah, I don't know why I used that, but I, I did like that sound and I started with a <laughs> quote from, I believe it's a Langston Hughes quote. I think it's a quote from somebody about, um, yeah, being a genius. Um, I forget the exact quote, but it kind of summed up Jean-Michel and how misunderstood he was. But yeah, no, that was a, that was a different kind of documentary, especially on that one, I had made the footage and filmed it while Jean-Michel was alive. And he'd asked me to make a documentary about him. And so we filmed a lot and we filmed interview portions and then also filmed him painting and things like that. And then, but then when he died, I took the footage and I kind of put it in a closet because he was very particular. He kind of really felt that a lot of his friends took advantage of him and you know, like sold paintings that he gave them or just like tried to take advantage of their um, association with him. So I was like, oh my God, even dead, I didn't want Jean-Michel to think I was taking advantage of him. And so I didn't do anything with the footage. And then I guess like 20 years later, I talked to a woman and they were doing a retrospective of his work. And they, and I mentioned that I had this footage and she was just shocked. And she said, you know, there's very little footage of him. Like, this is really, a, you have, you can't just leave it in your closet. You have to do something with it. You have to let people see this footage. And so I, I brought it out and I made a film out of it. And, um, you know, and I realized that it was important actually for Jean-Michel to get a chance for him to speak and to really make a film that I think he would have been happy to have, you know, the words told about him in this way. Absolutely. Uh, Tamra Davis, as you just mentioned, a long time after recording those images, you took uh, the film out of the closet. And I am wondering if you were surprised about what you previously recorded, because the gap between uh, those two moments, uh, the gap was very long. It was, but in all honesty, it feels like it was this, it felt so familiar and like yesterday because, you know, I was listening to a friend. <laughs> yeah. It was like a conversation with a friend. And so, you know, whenever you go put yourself back there, you kind of feel like that moment, I don't know, it didn't seem like so far away. And also the footage, I don't know, it didn't seem like it was that long ago, you know, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, and then I used, I filmed a lot of contemporary stuff, but I also thought it was really important to get people to understand what that world was like back in New York in those early 80s and the creativity in downtown New York and that scene, which kind of, which is where he came from. And, and so I, I think that having all the archival from that time and the music and um, I thought that was really important to kind of building the world so you could see where he came from. Furthermore, uh, Tamra Davis, uh, through this documentary called Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, The Radiant Child, we can completely uh, emerge ourselves uh, into uh, that New York uh, that you just uh, described. And I truly feel that it feels like this is both a tribute uh, to Basquiat uh, geniuses, but also a cautionary tale about the perils of fame and especially in the art industry. Would you say that you are seeing this documentary uh, with this vision? And what are, for example, uh, the purposes that you had at the beginning? I guess I wanted to um, tell his story the way I thought that 
he would have wanted it to be told. And it was a very sad story. I mean, he died at 27 years old. So it kind of was a tragedy, even though he got the fame he wanted and was the painter that he told everybody he was. And now, of course, as you know, his paintings go for I don't even know what his last painting sold for over a hundred million dollars, but you know, so I feel like he sacrificed himself in a way um, because he was that, you know, he, he didn't really know that he was that important when he died. He kind of thought that his life was over and um, yeah, I definitely saw it as a cautionary tale because it, he really listened to the critics and what people said about him. And he also had, um, a drug problem that I didn't really want to focus too much on, but it, it, it just got exasperated because he, um, you know, dealing with the fame and the stress and, you know, whatever, I think that that was really hard on him. And I think it's hard on anybody. And this is even before social media. So, you know, I think that it's, I think that we as a society need to be careful in our criticism towards artists and musicians and talent and um, I don't know, it's just, it's, you have to be careful because people are very sensitive and artists are sensitive. It, I don't know, it makes me think of like how Frank Ocean just played Coachella and he did an amazing set and it was experimental, <laughs> but people criticized it and then he wouldn't, he didn't play the next <laughs> night. And it's like, you can't, like Frank Ocean is a beautiful, gentle art, like he's an artist. You can't just like think that he's going to go and please you. And so, I don't know, I just feel like we have to be really careful as uh, as critics of what we think we need to tell everybody about our personal tastes. We have to be careful, uh, Tamra Davis, about the critics uh, that we are giving. And uh, you didn't have social media, social media didn't exist uh, during that time. And in this world of uh, making documentary, um, gaining the trust uh, of your subject is something um, very crucial and very important. Um, how did you go uh, about building uh, those uh, links and those uh, relations of trust uh, between all of the subjects uh, that you um, exchanged with, but also uh, with uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat? I mean, with, with Jean-Michel specifically, he was a friend. And I mean, that relationship was built over years of just hanging out all the time. So when we talk, we can talk and have fun and play and you can kind of feel that in the interview. And so I feel like that that's part of like having a, a like being interviewed by somebody, you know, so that's really important. But the other people that I interviewed for the film, a lot of them I knew already. But I think like if you, as a filmmaker or a documentary filmmaker, I think that it's important to just be open and go into a situation and listen and try to see, put the person at ease and um, just kind of be a good listener and try to make sure the person feels heard and understood. So I think like that's kind of what you try to do when you go in and, and just listen to people. There's some people that are really great interviewers. I've been really listening to Rick Rubin's podcast lately, and I think he's a really good interviewer. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Tamra Davis, um, being open and listening uh, deeply uh, to all of your uh, subject and the people you are talking to and to come back uh, to the title of that documentary. If I understood correctly, it was actually inspired from an essay from the author René Ricard uh, called The Radiant Child. And I truly believe that uh, this book may have a huge influence on the making of that documentary. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, I did interview Rene Ricard, and I do remember that article. You're right. Um, he did call him a radiant child. But I wasn't that influenced by Rene Ricard. I know a lot of people love Rene Ricard. He was an art critic for New York. But um, yeah, 
I wasn't as influenced by that as I was actually influenced by Jean-Michel. I kind of had his words to guide me and then his artwork. And I, I kind of really looked at all his paintings and his the what he was trying to say through his art and let that kind of guide me. And um and yeah, and I and I kind of had an understanding of who he was and what his influences were. And um yeah, I think I, and he also kind of gave me a list of people that he wanted me to interview back in the day and just yeah, people that I knew that could speak well of him. So I it was more I feel like that. I I guess I wasn't other than taking the title I wasn't as influenced by that article, although I thought it was really important for Jean-Michel's, and it was actually the article that put him on the map. He was the first person to really recognize Jean-Michel and, you know, talk about his work in a very serious way, kind of like brought him on the scene and was credited for that. Absolutely, Tamra Davis. That article uh, put it, Jean-Michel Basquiat, in the map. And you actually ended uh, the documentary with uh, the song uh, Free Him and Let His Soul Run Wild uh, because uh, you have a very uh, special relationship with music and uh, also... Um, in this city of New York City, uh, for example, filming the opening scene of 13, the musical, uh, on the Pulitzer Fountain. And I would love uh, to discuss about uh, this project and especially those first minutes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I loved making that film. And yeah, the opening number t takes place in New York City. And so um, the film was originally shot in Canada. So I really fought hard to make sure I got to shoot the opening in New York. So finally, we were able to, to do it. And it went from like, oh, you have five days to shoot in New York to like, you have three days to shoot in New York to like, you have literally, they said I had one day to shoot in New York. And I had to get at least two days because I was dealing with children. And you can only shoot with children a certain amount of hours. All those kids are under 15. They're between 12, 11 and 15. And so I only had like a certain amount of hours. And what's really interesting about that opening sequence is it's with all within one block because um, because I didn't have a lot of time, I couldn't move that entire company of crew and trucks and cast and everything. So I knew I was going to shoot the front of the plaza and the Pulitzer Fountain is across the street from that. And the park is across the street from that. And the stair, you know, all those areas, the street and everything is within one block. And so for me as a director, it, it allowed me to literally like we we didn't have police to stop cars as we cost cross the street we just went we the path that we did was literally the path of where those uh buildings and everything line up on a corner in new york and that was the only way i could make my day is to um basically walk everybody to those locations like coming down the hill in that park it's literally walking distance it's less everything is less than a block so that's kind of the and the genius of trying to pull something like that off. You can't move a company in the middle of New York City in a day. So I had to do it all in one place. You cannot move an entire uh, team and company uh all around New York City in one day, uh, Tamra Davis. And there are uh, multiple places, as you just mentioned. We have the Pulitzer Fountain uh, facing the Apple Fifth Avenue, also the Palace Entrance, but also Central Park. And I completely recognized all of those venues. And uh, it adds a lot of um, color to the feature film and it also uh, make a huge impression. Great. I know. I loved it. I thought, yeah, the production value you get out of New York City is insane. And so I just was like, please just give me, I could do it in a few hours, but you got to let me shoot there. So I was so happy <laughs> that they let me do it. 
Yeah. I mean, you can move a crew in a day in New York. You just lose time. Anytime you move your crew, you're an hour, that's an hour gone. And like I said, when you're dealing with children, like they can only work a certain amount of time and then they have to take breaks. And it's really, it's very complicated. So you really have to be very planned, very strategic. You always have Tamra Davis to be very strategic. And I would love uh, to know more about uh, this very specific storyline. Story How would you describe uh, the story of this uh, 12 years old uh, kid navigating a very special period of his life related to uh, the Bor Mitzvah and also dealing with his parents. Um, oh, I was so excited to get this job. It came to me, it was Netflix, and it was a play originally on Broadway called 13, the musical. And so I worked with the composer and so I worked with the writer and the composer to turn it into a film version. And um, yeah, the beginning of it takes place in New York City. It's about a boy whose parents get a divorce and he's got to move with his mother to a small town in the middle of nowhere. And he's supposed to have his bar mitzvah, which is <laughs> the biggest party that you're supposed to have and you're all your friends are supposed to be there. But he's moving to a new small town and he doesn't know anybody. And he thinks that if this party is like awful, like it's just, he'll never live it. You know, it'll just be a tragedy in his life. And so he really wants to come to the new town and have a party and kind of, um, you know, make it special. But in doing so, he ends up getting into quite a bit of trouble as he tries to get people to like him. And um, yeah, so it's just kind of what happens when you do things and I don't know. It's also, it's, I really liked working, you know, in that moment where you realize as a teenager, you try risky behavior and sometimes it doesn't work out and you mess up and it's like, you're, you know, the worst thing happens. And then you have to figure out how do you survive that moment? How do you say, sorry, how do you come back and not be known as the person who did the wrong thing the whole time? And I think that that was something that I really wanted to talk about is that everybody kind of messes up and it's really about how you respond to that and how you, um, you know, face that you did something wrong and you ask for forgiveness and you come back again. And I think it was a really important thing to kind of teach that forgiveness and that, um, you know, ability to um, kind of move past those moments in your life that you think are so devastating. But um, yeah, you can come back from them and kind of make yourself into a better person from those those tribulations. And I, I also just really loved working on the film because like I said, it's a musical and I got to work with beautifully talented young people on these gorgeous, like <laughs> great dance numbers. And it just was so fun. Every time I watched them, it just made me so happy to see this talent. And um, yeah, it I was really a fun film to make. In definitive, Tamra Davis, uh, this experience of directing uh, that feature film uh, called uh, 13 The Musical uh, was a perfect uh, match because it embodied uh, your actual knowledge of capturing uh, the essence of a song uh, because you directed a lot of music video, but all of this knowledge came from one address, which is the 855 North Vermont Avenue, which is the precise location of the Los Angeles City College. Can you tell us a little bit more about those beginnings as a director? Um, yeah, so I went to LA City College. It's in Los Angeles. It's on Vermont and Melrose. And it's a it's a city college where you only like when I was there, you paid $50 for tuition per semester. And I went through the film program and they had just built the building. So it was a really beautiful state of the art facility and they had all new film equipment and 
Um, I, I found it to be really helpful. It put me in a situation where I was making films and I showed them to students and you they got to review them and you could and I think that really if you want to be a filmmaker it's so important to make a film finish it and show it until you're really doing those steps and you actually show your movie which means it has to be done enough to show it and screen it you know you're not really a filmmaker but in the same thing is like if you make a movie and you show it you're a filmmaker so it works both ways and I think that going to film school, you get assignments. And so you really have to finish those assignments and show them. And you can kind of see how your work compares with other students. And you can see, oh, I'm talent, you know, I have an ability to get um, a message across or people seem to like my film. So I think in that sense, it gave me confidence that the stuff I was doing, I was, um, I was definitely making things that people really liked and I really enjoyed making them myself. So I, I really enjoyed the school experience and I had a pretty unique, I don't know, I liked the school that I went to. I thought it, I thought that they had a good program there and it wasn't that expensive. So by the time I got out of it, I wasn't in like a ton of student debt or anything. And I had like, <laughs> I had like some cool short films to show. Some of the other schools, they don't let you only, maybe you make one film or and you work on everybody else's and then you don't even own that film, they own it. Or, you know, this spends tens of thousands of dollars to go there. And I thought, wow, I could spend that tens of thousands of dollars on making movies. So, yeah, so in that case, I really loved the the school program. But what happened to me is when I got out of film school, I thought, wow, I can make a movie now. I'm so, you know, I'm really good. I'm ready to make my first feature. And I had um, a script and I had a videotape of the bands that I wanted on the soundtrack. And so I went into a movie company and presented my script and my vision for the film and here's the bands on the soundtrack and basically I was kind of like laughed at like they nobody was looking for a 23 year old girl out of film school in in the um late 80s to direct like it was not it was unheard of and yes they were definitely hiring guys out of film school like it was kind of like a rite of passage you'd be like yeah I just hired this dude from USC or this guy from UCLA but no like it was kind of sad there there was no room for a young girl coming out of film school at that time but Luckily, or whatever, I had on that videotape, I made a video of a band that I wanted to be on my soundtrack, and I filmed it with um, like a Super 8 camera, and I got a call from the record company that the band was on, and I was like, oh my god, now I'm in trouble I didn't even get permission from that band and I had to go in to talk to the record company and see like what what kind of trouble I was in because I, I didn't ask for approval. I just used the song and I made a video. And instead, when I met with the head of their creative department, they said, how did you do this? And I... I said, I shot it myself in Super 8. And they were like, this is brilliant. We want to give you all this money to direct a video for some other band if you can make them look like this. And so then, like overnight, I was a music video director and I started getting all these jobs from all these different record companies. And I became incredibly successful as a music video director. And that was, yeah, it was kind of by not mistake, but it was like I was on my road to one thing and I pivoted, thankfully, to a new genre and a new medium that was developing, which was music videos. And I had a style that was unique and interesting. And it was at a time when MTV, everything looked like really slick and clean. And I came in with like this kind of edgy, cool, black and white, grainy look. And um, <laughs> yeah, I got ex I just started working. And and it took probably like six or seven years of me making music videos before I could convince somebody that I was capable of doing a feature, which is sad, but in one sense, I kind of felt like in those years, I really worked hard and I figured out what I, I became a director and maybe I wouldn't have made such a good movie if I made that first film coming out of film school at 24. And by this time at 29, I really knew, I, I felt really confident and I really knew what to do. And I, I knew how to work with actors. I knew how to work with how to move, you know, cameras around in a day and what I could do in a day. And 
so I feel like I really, it kind of worked out to be the best that I got all that experience from film school, from doing all these music videos. And I made short films in the meantime, like I would save my money for music videos and make little short narratives and put them into film festivals and kind of try to get myself known. But yeah, basically I felt like finally I got, I was able to get somebody to um, make a movie. And I, I agreed to make a movie originally for $400,000. That's how much I thought I could do gun crazy for. Cause that's how much they said they had for the budget. And then I was lucky when I signed um, Drew Barrymore on the film, we were able to sell like, another country or actually it was Michael Ironside. When Michael Ironside signed up, I was able to sell my Asian markets and I got another $400,000. So I was able to make the film <laughs> for $800,000. Yeah. So it was, and I did it. Yeah, I did it. I think I shot it in 23 days. Yeah. And I'm really proud of that film. You are very proud of that film, uh, Tamra Davis, because it worked out uh, for the best. And you just mentioned one very powerful word, which is bend, because you are currently working on a project called Boys Band that is retracing uh, the history of a historical uh, musical bands. Uh, with the Beatles, N, S, Y, N, C, the Backstreet Boys, New Kids on the Block, the Jackson 5, the Beatles, New Edition, One Direction, and BTS. Yes, I am. That's true. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, I'm doing, I got, during this, um, you know, everybody's been, there's been a strike on, so you normally I'd be working on a TV show or a film, but um, we haven't been able to work. So I got a call from Paramount Plus that they wanted to make a movie about boy bands, and the producers were, are, they are actually the people who called me, Van Toffler and Johnny Wright. And Van Toffler, he used to run MTV, and I knew him for God, for decades. I've known Van. And then Johnny Wright, I knew because he's a manager for InSync and Backstreet Boys. And I met him during when I worked with Britney. And so those guys kind of knew me from my days of doing music videos. And I'd done some boy band videos. And they asked if I would be interested in directing this. Um, and I was like, yes, this is perfect. I, I love these bands. And it was a it's a fun thing to work on now while, you know, we're still pretty shut down. The actors are still on strike. I think the writers just um, made a deal. So I'm psyched that things are going to start moving again. But um, yeah, so it's super fun to be making a documentary. It's a three part series. It's going to be announced probably in the next couple days. Like it, I think in the next, yeah, I think on the 27th or something, they'll announce it officially. But yeah, I go from Beatles to BTS is kind of my span. So yeah, going from the Beatles were the first time the the term boy band was coined. And currently the biggest boy band or biggest band in the world right now is BTS. And so I'm going to feature them as well. I am looking forward to see that documentary directed by yourself and produced uh, by Johnny Wright and Von Toffler. Thank you very much, Tamra Davis. Yeah, I'm excited too. Yeah, those guys are awesome and I love working with them. Yeah, and Paramount Plus is cool because like I have it's not like I have free access to their library, but they own, you know, they're, they own the MTV, you know, all those libraries. So there's so much in there because they, you know, had TRL and all that. So it's going to be really fun to kind of be able to dig back in. And it's so fun doing research today. <laughs> I got, I went down a, <clears throat> a dart, a deep hole into the female uh, K-pop bands and was like watched a ton of Blackpink today and so it was so fun to be watching these videos and be like I can't believe I'm working and I'm watching carpool karaoke with Blackpink or watching all their videos <laughs> and I'm working so I really enjoyed it <laughs> 